you've never heard it before. The Noxie and Cax Show with Liz Knox and Kara L. M. Ard. <laughs> Let's get it. Go. Welcome, fans, to the Noxie and Cax Show. We are at episode eight. And we've been so lucky to have some incredible guests on the show. And today, it's just you and me, Cax. It feels like a little lonely, but kind of nice. Oh, it's just the two of us. We love it. It's good. <laughs> we're back, back in our little chit chat. And then uh, we're going to be chatting about the Olympics. And uh, I'm looking forward for this uh, beautiful episode with you, Noxie. There is so much to talk about. So like you said, we are going to recap the Olympics, talk about some highs and lows, and tie it all together with the burning question that everyone's asking. Where does this leave women's hockey? So let's get to the fun stuff. Um, closing ceremonies. Want your take about the outfits? And, you know, let's compare opening ceremonies to closing ceremonies first. Okay. So when it when you talk about the two of those events, I'm thinking Canadian outfits for sure. And you mentioned it. Uh, I asked you earlier what or which one did you like best? I really thought that the opening ceremony ones the red was fire like the outfits yeah. for canada oh. and by the way we crushed it so like i lulu lululemon lululemon i will take anything you send my way but no <laughs> just kidding I, I, it was gorgeous like everything the fits were great on the men's side and women's side it was just awesome um i personally really 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 liked the red ones and then you kind of like convinced me a little bit with well okay i will say like one style wise yeah i would definitely more wear the red because the white like i mean i will get that dirty in about 0.5 seconds <laughs> but the thing that i loved about the white ones was the hidden flag and i didn't really see this feature until like because i watched the closing ceremonies and i saw they all had flags which i was like yeah you're at the olympics you mm -hmm. have you makes know sense. a national flag yeah it makes sense but they were actually like tucked in a zipper in the jacket and i just thought that is so cool like it's Very not neat. some dinky little paper flag it's like literally like a cape that they can pull out i just yeah, i, I thought like, that was a great touch it's a, a six sick touch deck technically like lulu like they just put them in there and then they unroll or whatever i don't even know how they did it it so was cool. actually freaking amazing yeah and and we I, did go ahead sorry i was just gonna say like and just the, those two ceremony from talking to people that have been you know, to both of them, like missing them due to COVID was like a nightmare. They didn't want to think about that. Those are like magical <laughs> is the word that comes to, to their mind when they, they describe it. So I could only imagine how it was there with their it's teammates. True. And, and like, like how, cool how they did, how they did the like snowflakes that eventually oh. drifted up into like the Chinese style lanterns. Like that's kind of the feel that they were going for. I mean, it was, I don't know how they did that in person. Like I'm literally watching on TV being like, oh, this is just like digitalized for us. And they're just standing in an empty stadium, like <laughs> a bird's nest. But no, it was incredible. And some really cool moments. Um, speaking of our Canadians. So we did want to talk about Blair Turnbull, obviously yes. women's hockey player and Ryan Summers, who is a bobsledder or is a bobsledder. Mm -hmm. And they got to close out the ceremonies together, like walking for their country how through cool. that stadium. How cool. And both both wearing medals. Yep. Like, I mean, I, I, I was excited watching Blair, like after the fact, like celebrating when, when Ryan did this and like jumping everywhere and now like seeing them and the pictures they took together and everything and how it started to how it ended, like Ugh. both fiance, like get to go to the Olympics together. Like that story in itself, like it's almost a movie. Let's, let's write it a is. movie. Here yeah. These are this. like, forget D1 babies. These are Olympic babies coming at you. <laughs> No and, pressure, and, guys. <laughs> and like I like he worked so hard to get there and, and she was talking about it and everything. And so did she. And and you know, it, I was watching the race itself and and just the excitement around like the the yeah. announcers. Like they were just like, Oh my god, they're still in the green, they're still in the green, like just going at curves after curves. They need to they need to keep it going. I don't I, it was just awesome, it was an amazing. Uh, Olympics just gets me, I guess. Yeah, you know, going. it's true. It's true. It's such a buildup and such an anticipatory event. And you know how much work these athletes have put in. Oh my God. And it was cool to watch like Blair and Brianne Jenner watch, you know, they kind of like kept panning back to them in the stands yeah. and there's lots of cool pictures and it really does. It just pays homage to the, all their hard work. So before we get to the gold medal game, I do want to talk about, cause I didn't really see these pictures, but you said that there was some pretty, uh, nifty, yeah. almost bigger skating style. <laughs> 
pics of Spooner and Malte. Yeah, well, we saw this before, and I don't know if you saw it, but at Worlds in August, actually, I don't know if it's an Ohio State celebration <laughs> type of deal or whatever it is, but um, Spooner just grab, grabs uh, Emma Maltes, who's like five foot tall, maybe, and Spooner yeah. is pretty big, and puts her literally on her shoulder. Like, so, <laughs> like is on her shoulder there's pictures i'm sure we can find them and put them on on the the episodes here and then they they actually i think saw the figure skaters and i can't remember their name and this is my bad on this anyways but they did a, they performed the lift on the closing yeah. ceremony and it was gorgeous it was absolutely impeccable so cool and then spooner and emma Malte decided to, <laughs> <laughs> decided to just do their their thing so they just like they actually tweeted at them like hey how about this lift for yeah like, we'll whatever. see if we can and, get pictures of those because yeah. that's just hilarious and she's like on her shoulder like just like and <laughs> one end like spooner you're and strong course, girl <laughs> yeah and spooner of course like she she competed in battle of the blades where you know she figure mm-hmm. skated and she lifted um oh gosh his name's escaping me right now but we anyway so with names <laughs> yeah we're bad with names. memory was not our strong suit either of us so <laughs> just give us a podcast and some mics um but no really fun really fun to see them having a good time with it so let's get to the serious stuff uh the gold yeah. medal game i mean an incredible yeah. matchup as always we knew we were going to be in a one goal game we were both wrong about the overtime but yeah yeah i we mean were. a couple of those posts especially in just the first period mm-hmm Okay, you go ahead. Because uh, a couple uh, of those go in and you're in a different game, right? Well, Anna Brandt on the door, like, and she f- fans on it a little bit and it hits like, and Renee was trying to get there and she made yep. it there, but it was clear post. That thing should have been in. So that would have been one nothing US right then, yep. like beginning of the first. Um, and then, you know, there's two other ones, but that one to me is the one that kind of like hurt probably the US the most, like in terms of momentum, in terms of like, Maybe like making Canada a bit nervous, like getting that yeah. first goal in and and going. But as soon as that happened, I was like, "Ooh, I yeah. think we're done." I think it. And then of course, Canada had the goal called back on the mm-hmm. blatant offside. Like I will say, <laughs> Mercy. <laughs> like I know Nurse. I, I think I read somewhere that she went right to spoons. Was like, "Girl, I'm sorry, I owe you one." And she ends up scoring mm-hmm. the first goal. So you know what? She made up for it. She redeemed but, herself. Yeah. Blatant offside, but again, another TSN, you know, turning point, if you will, where it's like, hey, that could very easily be USA's kind of wake up moment. Like, oh shit, we just got away with them. Like, let's go end to end and and make sure it's in the back of their net. So, exactly. I, I mean, that's the great game, right? Like, that's it's ebbs and flows, and and it was executed like to a T, right? It's a, like for those of you who are watching, it's a perfect face off play, wins back, and then Claire Thompson takes it down, passes it to to Nurse who's turn. Like, it's it's a uh, you could tell these girls have done so much yeah. during centralization, like in terms of like plays, setup, offensive, like generating play stuff. I, it was just awesome to see it all came together that game. So that yeah, goal was it, neat too. It really did. And you know what? I do want to talk a little bit about the US because once again, Hillary Knight shows up against Canada. I mean, she's just yeah. in the right zones. She's taking the pucks to net, putting smart pucks on net. And I think that when you look at, you know, the veteran players on both teams, they know that it's not always going to be that highlight reel bar down goal. And I think that's where Knight has really like come a long way. She's putting low shots on the net, driving the net with her stick on the ice. And if it's not her, it's going to be, you know, the girl, the second wave coming in behind her. So absolutely. And she's like, she's dangerous. Like we've seen her score goals from the goal line. We've seen her score or like from anywhere. Her shot is just so like, it's so nifty. It's fast. It's like, it doesn't necessarily, the release is quick. It's the quickest thing I've seen. And, um, if it's not a shot, it's a tip it's she's in front of the net. She's dangerous. She's somehow is finding ways to, to get one or two every time she plays Canada. And again, she did it. And, and I thought she was actually like one of the ones that like wanted it till the end, like had the gas in the tank to do it as well too. Like she, I don't know. She, they were, they were missing a couple players and we will talk about this and some speed out there and everything but uh yeah that that line was uh dangerous and then the second line as well too came in and i i wish they would have used a couple other lines to help those two up uh, yeah as I'd say. so this yeah. is this is kind of one of the stories right it's mm-hmm. it's i mean it's very easy for all of us to be critical you know keyboard warriors included <laughs> You watch a game and you say, what is this coach thinking? You know, so we're not, we're not in the dressing room. We don't know these girls like Joel Johnson does, Mm -hmm. you know, there's no question he's making the right decisions in his mind for, for success for his team. But from the outside looking in, 
you ran, you know, two pairs of D. I think they only even dressed, you know, you only saw five names really on the back end. And then really put a lot of pressure and onus on your first two lines. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of depth, like you just, you're hoping for a little bit more consistency across the board for the USA. Yeah. And I was actually a bit nervous, uh, not nervous, but surprised because um, throughout the preparations and all the re rivalry games and stuff, he was kind of running his bench, like just let's see how we do. And like us was doing actually good without, you know, cutting the bench is what we call it. Yeah. Um, so I was like, man, when they start doing it, that's going to be dangerous. Like I was like, shoot, like we're, we might be in trouble, but I feel like, I don't know if they started too late. I don't know how or what happens. And, and, you know, Canada was pretty physical too. So like, if you want to keep in the game, like us was going all out in the first 10 minutes, like yeah. they were going physical as well too. But then you get, you get these six girls, like you're saying, uh, you know, Carpenter, Kessel, um, Abby rock. And then you get, uh, Knight, Knighter, sorry, Coin and um, Anna Brandt. And then we barely saw Cameron Easy uh, as well, mm -hmm. too. Like she was kind of like on and off. And then the youngster line with Panic played a little bit, which is usually a shutdown line. And they, um, they didn't necessarily play them against Poulin. I don't know if there was like some, you know, stuff that they, throughout the, the tournaments, they may have, I don't know, not felt comfortable with putting them out there. I, I have no clue. We, yeah. We're the outside looking in again. Yeah. We have no information. It just felt like um, maybe we, they lost uh, like a little bit, not confidence in themselves, but they were trying to like, get that fuel again and get like, okay, how are we going to do this? Like they started icing the puck. They started like, there was a yeah. lot going on and you could tell that on the back and end, Keller was like, Keller and Barnes were, were getting tired to chase those puck down. Like if yeah. you're Canada and you just dump it in, The D has to pivot and you chase turn. that stupid puck. Yep. Trust me, I'm a D now, <laughs> and I absolutely hate it. And when your players turn it over at the blue line, Richards will, like, Chris, like everyone's going to be, yes, you're right, Cax. As soon as they turn it over at the blue line and it goes right back and you can't change yeah. and you can't get into, you know, a de decent rest and you're being played that much, like, it's tough. So we got to give them, like, a, like credits for, for performing yep. the way they did too till the end because – um yeah they we saw a lot of them them on the ice let's put it that way yeah Maybe exactly much, potentially and on the flip side i mean and again it's hindsight right like we know the outcome of the game but yeah. this canada team was just fun like they were fun to watch <laughs> and i haven't had that feeling um in a long time honestly with the national team and again like i'm well removed from the program this is not like this is not any sort of bitterness or anything but they were fun and you know you see them before the game like dancing in their warm up yeah. and you see them picking each other up when malte scores her goal even though it's you know the the ninth goal or eighth goal whatever it was uh in the preliminary game like the team is fired up for her like that i don't know it just it really did come across as a team and i think that yeah you know, knowing what we know now and seeing them succeed. It was, it was a really fun group to, to see on the ice. And it was a, it was different hockey than the previous years. Maybe we've seen too. same players, right? Like it's just, right. um, they played maybe in a system that allowed them to be a bit more creative or to maintain the puck a bit more versus dumping and chasing or whatever it is, but they truly actually, you know, bought into the systems and went yeah. with it offensively and defensively. And I think they didn't waste any time in the D zone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they got it out quickly. They didn't waste any energy. Like if we, if we look at the, like, yeah. And Renee faced like 40 shots again. Like, let's yep. talk about this. It's it. U.S. brought some stuff on that. Like it, oh, yeah. it's not, not, it's not to kind of like remove that from them, but yeah, I, I just thought Canada, all three lines were able to Four lines. All four lines were able to yeah. actually bring they're some all offense rolling. too. It was cool. And, it was nice. And breaking some records while they're at it. So yes. uh, I want to start off with Sarah Nurse, uh, breaking Ooh. the record for most points at an Olympic tournament with 18. Yeah. Uh, previously held, I believe, by Haley Wickenheiser. And also breaking the most assists in a single Olympic tournament with 13. Of course, all this spotlight that she's been seeing you know, she's one of few BIPOC players in women's hockey in general at the, at, you know, at the professional level during black history month. I mean, it's just, it's a feel good story. I mean, she lived beyond, I think many people's expectations of what, what she was going to show at the Olympics. And, and let's not forget she was hurt right before yeah. Christmas and everything guys. She just came back from uh, like recovered from a knee injuries or whatever comes back on the ice, goes out, 
and it lights out. She gets one opportunity when, you know, lines are needed to be shuffled then takes it and runs with it and absolutely yeah. crushed it too. Like it was, she can play anywhere. Like yeah. she was a, a stud, like shut down center, like so strong to first liner, like, yeah. <laughs> and, and feeding Poulin and Jenner, like the whole time, like, it was just awesome. Like all yeah. three of them played really, really well together too. So fun to watch. And, and you mentioned her name, Brienne Jenner, also breaking records, Claire Thompson, breaking records on the blue line. I mean, it's just, it really is nice to see, uh, you know, kind of the points going right through their roster. It just yeah. seemed everyone was clicking. And like I said, just like a fun group to watch. So um, I will, well, we'll talk about Philly too, because she, you know, had a huge name coming into this tournament. She was a breakout player from Princeton, put up tons of points, uh, you know, before Olympics and in the preliminary round. And you know what? I think this is a kid with a hugely bright future in the women's game. Uh, you know, wish her, you know, success and healthy health uh, as she goes forward. Yes. Um, a little bit quieter, maybe in in the gold medal game, but that you know, it's a young kid on a big stage. So I, I'd love to hear your take on on Fillier. Yeah, I think I think you put it right there. Like it's a. It's a, you have those opportunities uh, and those moments. And, and of course, like it's a high stake game. It's like, everyone's there. It's a gold medal. It's, but you know, it's not like she didn't do anything. Like she was yeah. creating and that line was going and everything. And then Mello was in and out with the, that line too. So it's adjustments. Like I'm not giving her any excuses. I thought she did an amazing job as a, a second line center. Like she mm -hmm. brought it, she challenged the U S maybe didn't find the back of the net, but did create a ton. And yeah, then maybe still wearing them down. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, you know, um, got the other lines going as, as you're supposed to be doing. And, you know, you, you, you have, against Poo that comes out and gets a goal or two. And, and it's just like, it, it, it is, it is like, you know, Philly is going to become one of those and I have no doubt about it. And, and, you know, I think her game was great again. I think she had a phenomenal tournament the entire mm -hmm. time. And uh, I really want to watch her play for a long, long time. So yeah. Canada's like future is looking bright. That's Absolutely. all like, I just, yeah. I think Philly is going to be a big piece of it for sure. As you said, we, we can't really move on without talking about <laughs> the greatest women's hockey player of all time. Yeah. There's no question. The GOAT. For Olympics, <laughs> she scored in all four gold medal games. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Poulin, I mean, uh, how do you even summarize? Like, she, she's hands down the best women's hockey player ever. Listen, that, that goal, that first goal of hers was probably her favorite too because she did the pickpocket thing oh yeah and made and, it look like a, a video game like and just it is textbook like i know from talking to her that sometimes she's like i i like like blocking shots or doing a huge back check more than i like to score goals and that one was just like it's a typical game like she does it all the time from playing with like an agenda with us i was like oh she's coming back watch out pickpocket <laughs> so lifts the stick and goes turns around and and it's in the net like too bad and that's again that was the exact play Big pocket, the girl panicked, didn't see her coming, was really, really strong on the puck usually yep. and protects her stick so well or protects her puck so well. And then it was just game over. As soon as she did it, I was like, oh, we <laughs> like just got super excited <laughs> right then. I'm like, yeah, it's happening. And oh, I was so excited. For and her. honestly, um, like the only thing we can say better than you know, Poulin's performance on the ice is just the character of her, of her personality oh. off the ice and incredibly humble. She is exactly as she comes across in those interviews. Um, I remember I was at under 22 camp, actually, I believe it was a world championship team that I was trying out for. I think it was my last year in the program and we're all in the hotel and basically we're told, you know, like we're making cuts tonight. So some of you will be on the next flight out. And I remember Pooh coming into our room. I can't remember who, I think Jen Wakefield was, was my roommate at the time. And, uh, I was like, obviously I'm nervous. Like I'm, I'm feeling like I'm already yeah, a little out of my you, league. Yeah. And, and Poulin comes in and she's just like, yeah, like I'm just going to pack my bags just in case, because I just like, I didn't have a great, and I'm like looking at her like girl. And like, she's just so humble like that. Like that's, that's how she thinks is like, you never take an opportunity for granted. Um, you know, you're always lifting up the people around you. You're always crediting them ahead of yourself. And it's just genuinely how she is. So she's yeah. like, again, the best player on the ice and easy to like off the ice. So we're happy yeah. to see her with the right color around her neck again. My God. Yes. Uh, First um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about viewership yes. and visibility that matters now more than ever in women's sports, but especially in women's hockey. 
So some stats I'll throw at you. Yeah. 3.5 million viewers in the US off NBC and 1.3 million in Canada off CBC. I, I right there. Okay. So 3.5 million in the US. So US has so much like going on there in sports, usually all at once, all like nonstop, right? So it's really hard for hockey to be a prime sport, usually just mm-hmm. football is so big and any other things. So to have hit 3.5 million at NBC. And I think it's the second most viewed since 2019, yep. as far as a game goes, it's huge. It's absolutely phenomenal. It is, you know, more than any men's hockey game. I think they mentioned or something like that. Yeah, too. More than and, any NHL game this season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And yeah, it's, yeah. On, it's on at 11 o'clock at night. Yes. Like, I'm just going to say that it is. It's a top <laughs> time. No, you're good. It is I the worst the schedule. Absolutely not. It's the worst schedule. So you know that people were following. Like, that's yes. my point. Like we got a huge um, viewership, both games from, uh, you know, the, the preliminary. Mele- wow. That's a tough word in French. <laughs> Preliminary or the match preliminary, yeah. guys. There you go. Um, <laughs> preliminary game, US Canada. Um, and, and again, in the final, and people were just following uh, on the US side of the border and in Canada. You mentioned 1.3 million in um, Canada for CBC, right? Largest mm-hmm. viewership for them. Um, I, it was on TSN, it was on RDS in French. Yeah. It was like, it was, I wonder. This is just a snippet of the viewership that it had. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, I would love to to have that number compiled. And if anybody out there is a stats junkie and wants to click, (laughs) you know, do some quick math and and comments. I mean, it's true. Like people have gone out of their way. Um, They're willing to sacrifice their sleep. They're willing to sacrifice their next day at work um, just to watch this game, literally to watch it play out. It's, it's, it's beyond performative at this point. You don't, you don't watch women's hockey because it's the right thing to do at 11 o'clock at night. Like you want to see what happens. And I just think, uh, you know, what, what a way to finish off, um, you know, the last four years, what these athletes have been through, what they've been fighting for, for women's hockey. Like it's, it's the product is proving itself right now. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, it ties into visibility this entire year. Like, let's be honest, like, we had worlds in August. Then the rivalries were all on TV. Uh, everything was there. People were watching. And then yes, yep. COVID hits, but we had other games that were scheduled. People were going to those games. Like, yeah, it is not just because yes, the Olympics are big and it's the final and it's a gold medal game. But I think that once again, this year has proven to everyone that it's not just a one-time thing. It's a yep. we want to see it and we want to put it out there. And if you actually put the games on tv people will watch it so we'll watch yeah exactly so on that note that's a great segue actually into i want to know what your golden moment was so what you know it can be any sport or it can be women's hockey what about the olympics like what's one thing that you'll look back and be like oh that was the 22 olympics oh man there's like well the mm, okay so let's say outside of hockey for for one second here um I was watching the um, slope style uh, snowboard and um, Max Parrott is from here is, is a Quebec native and um, has had like the uh, utmost cool, well, toughest, I guess, journey, but like coolest way to cap it up or like, you know, closing, closing it all up with a gold medal uh, during that, uh, that performance, he, he beat cancer and then got the gold medal. And I, um, you know, from people that have known him for a long time, they can only say great things about the the athlete and the guy. And I just thought that was fantastic. And and to be honest with you, like I am so cheesy, but I freaking love that we won gold this year. And I love that um, these girls got to do it. I, you know, Emron Smashmeyer is the first time goaltender close to her and everything, whatever she went through, Ambrose, like all those girls. Uh, not being centralized to come back. Jenner having a huge freaking tournament, like pulling on top of it. I just felt like this team, like Troy and his staff has done something amazing with that team. And that is my golden moment in the sense that watching them getting that gold medal was, uh, I watched the whole thing <laughs> stayed, stayed up way too late, <laughs> watched them with their medals. And um, yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't be happier for those girls. You know, you train with them, all year and and then they finally get to do it and 
it, it was beautiful. I loved it. Yeah. That was my gold moment. Sorry, Noxie. I went on. No, that. don't apologize. That's that's perfect. I agree. Like the Max Pro or Parrot, uh, you know, his whole story yeah. is just like, I mean, that's that's a that's the kind of stuff that you make movies about because mm-hmm. he's just had to overcome so much adversity, adversity that you know you and I couldn't even fathom. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and for these athletes, I mean, their sport is. Like that is the air that we breathe. That is, you know, what keeps us waking up in the morning. And for him to come out of it with a goal, you know, with a medal around his mm-hmm. neck is just like, oh, uh, it's, it's incredible for me again. I'm, I'm like you, I'm a little soft, my gold moment. And it, it wasn't, you know, super televised or anything, but in the, in the hallway after the gold medal game, yeah. seeing Pula and Hillary Knight kind of hug each other have a conversation obviously we can't really tell or see what they're saying because they're both wearing masks but i just i looked at that moment as like a personification of the last three four years watching the cwhl fold forming the pwhpa the two biggest names in women's hockey you know still being able to come into the into the hallway into the locker room afterwards show a a ton of respect and just really like know that this is a huge huge moment Yes, the medals matter. Yes, wins and losses matter. But at the end of the day, those two players have done, you know, more for women's hockey, I think, than most athletes will ever do for their sport. So I, yeah. it, it was a touching moment for me. I know them both. I love them both. And I just think, you know, this is like when you talk about the rivalry and how, oh, yeah, they, like, you know, they want to kill each other on the ice and then they come off the ice and they're, you know, they're friends like that. That moment right there takes yeah. like class. It takes character. And it's, it's true. It's a, it is a a beautiful moment to for women's hockey in general, like the two of them, you know, if, if they didn't come together, it's maybe Canada and us don't come together. Who knows like what, what could have like gone. uh, And I'm sure there's other players in there and involved in in the PWHPA and where we're going with this, but um, yeah, like they've played together and obviously here in Montreal. And I think that they've always had a really big respect for one another as athletes yep. um of course you hate each other when they put the other jerseys on probably you know like the the blue versus the red type of thing but i i think that they are both people that see the bigger picture and um can see through and through when it comes to building a better and brighter future for women's hockey and just seeing it um you know that if they work together actually yep. we could make it happen so yeah i think it's uh yeah, it was, it was sweet. It was good to see. It was like, you know, back in, they're almost in Montreal, high-fiving after a goal or something. Like, yeah, it was, yeah, uh, seriously. It, it was the, nice. The, the loyalties run deep. Okay. I, and that's I, honestly a perfect, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's a big props to, you know, I will say big props to Hillary to come out of her way, probably uh, with yeah. the silver medal, medal around her neck to like tell her good job. And probably like, you've done an amazing job that game and everything so yeah it's this is what people need to see and how much like they should respect those two um and bring them to yeah they see it bigger than anyone else and and, absolutely uh, playing for something bigger than themselves and it's almost like you know a perfect step into how we're going to kind of start to round out this episode which is where does this leave women's hockey Mm -hmm. okay now we're going to start off (laughs) with answering honestly answering some genuine questions that I'm sure you have received. I received probably every women's hockey player has received because we are spokespersons for our sport. So I'm going to start with this first one. Why didn't such and such a player make the national team? Okay. We get asked this a lot. There's a long answer to this one. I'm not a scout. So just, you know, take my word for what it is. These players are invested in from the time they are under 18 or under 16. Now I think. Um, Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're found at these camps, they're flagged as, you know, elite players of their age group. And as they progress, if they continue to press on the same trajectory that, you know, hockey can is expecting or USA hockey is expecting, then they keep going back to these camps. They go back to under 20 or under 18 camp. Then they go to under 22 slash development camp. Then they proceed on to the senior camp and there's money, there's resources, there's time put into these athletes. So Long story short, if you get in at the right time, you have a chance at a long future in the national team program. Yeah. If you miss your window, I'm not saying it's impossible, but if you miss that window, it's really hard to convince 
the organization to take player B over player A, we've put a ton of money and resources into. Exactly. It's a, it's not a business ran type of thing, but it is like that. It's, it's a, it's a, you're getting at a certain age at some point, even on the development side, like you're 25 or 23, usually 22, actually, there's a, a, a big decision that's made. Do we keep investing in this player's development or do we invest in a younger player who might do the same? Right. Thing, right. And, um, you know, I, I say it like that and bluntly because it is that that's what happened. If the senior team is like packed and no one is retiring, then, then there's a, a gap there that's missing, mm-hmm. right? There's a, the U22 they need to have slash turnover. They need to have the next generation coming in at all times. It's exactly. It's, and, and the other thing too, and this kind of, you know, leads into a bigger conversation about the PWHPA. You need to have a best on best league. Yeah. You need to have somewhere where all of these players, including, you know, players overseas on the Finnish team, on the yeah. Swiss team, you need to have a best on best league that you can watch these players play against Marie Philippe Poulet. Because I can guarantee you, you know, we played in the CWHL together. I'll give a great story. This is a perfect example, right? Jess Jones, okay, played yeah. for Brampton. We were, you know, second last place team. She ties Mary Philippe Poulet in points. And of course, Montreal is first place team. Mm-hmm. Jonesy doesn't go to the national team camp that year. Like, there's no question. She hasn't been invested in for the, you know, the number of times. And one good season, again, Dozens. like it, it could be, you know, it could be a number of things. But you have a best on best league and she shows up that season. She shows up the next season. All of a sudden, she's starting to turn heads, say, hey, wait a second. This wasn't a fluke. This wasn't a one-time thing. Like, this kid's good. Mm -hmm. Why don't we give her a shot? Because now, the investment that the players are getting is from their league versus it being solely from the governing bodies. Exactly. And I don't think it's a... it's a it's a group or a league thing or anything else. Like you said, it, it's best on best. It's something that stays consistent. Like we saw actually Enzo as Enzo Fibete is, is probably the, the girl that <clears throat> pretty much got dropped when we, if we can call it that uh, when she was 22 and then has improved and stayed consistent and continuously yes. finished like at the top of the league and on time and was playing with Mary and, and more. And she had her chance. She, she played, you know, she remade it. I think it was 10 years after she got cut. Yeah. She got reinvited. Right. So, yes. So, so those are like unique moments. But at the end of the day, like to anyone that's asking this question, too, it, it's a good question. It's a team of 24. Yeah. And there is about, I don't know how many thousands of people, players that are trying out for this one team. Yeah. And this is why we need a league and that legit gives you more opportunities than these four. I mean, these 24 spots Yeah, and usually every four years or three years, there may be four or five spots at a time, right? It's like an NCA scenario or anything. It's a turnaround. It's yep. who's coming in, who's getting older, who's not, who's hurt and who's healthy. And um, it's funny because we get, Oh, you play hockey. You must be on the Olympic team. Actually, no. No. And it's okay. (laughs) And it's okay. (laughs) We play professionally. We will have a professional league that's like, you know, everyone will know about. And those questions will become like, you know, not asked anymore per se, or not necessarily popular. But at the end of the day, why such and such player didn't make it? Well, there's 24, only 25 that can make it. And the and other it's thing, not the best of the best, it's whoever fits that roster too. Right. And that's something to remember as well. And the other thing that's to consider too, right, is like you have kids playing NCAA, you have kids playing uh, hockey post college, you have kids playing overseas. You're coming from all these different walks. And Cax and I had this conversation just before we mm-hmm. started recording. There's this idea that you're going to play your best hockey in your senior year of college. Like that's when you're peak athleticism. And I can tell you from experience, and I'm sure Cax will tell you the same thing. I wasn't my best hockey player until I was three or four or five years out of college because you're playing again. I was lucky. I got to play against Carol Ouellette. Like I got to play against Pooh. I got to play against Turnbull. Like I'm playing against these players and I have Jocelyn LaRock ahead of me. I'm seeing the game completely different because I have a world-class defender exactly. and she knows the game better than I do because she's had more coaching. She's had, you know, she's had the experience. So it, it is also kind of in a roundabout way. Like you need that, 
that sustainable model so that these players can continue to be better. You're not your, you know, Sarah Fillier is not her best, which is terrifying because she's fantastic. (laughs) We need a place for her to play where she's going to get even better. You graduate, you're 23, 22, 23, 24. And we're supposed to peak as athletes, uh, women, anyways, uh, between 28 and 35. So like, I'm just saying you're what you're exactly explaining there is let's provide something and keep them actually playing and going and facing the top of the top and the and and they will improve tremendously picture yourself right now and having the same ice time that you had in college mm-hmm. at our level with the pita or with being the on the ice every day getting every day. to work out every day with your teammates you know going for lunch having team bonding you know going out team partying all that stuff that all plays into uh, exactly. elements of professional hockey that we haven't had yet exactly um we, yeah we could go on forever honestly we'll get I there do, we'll, get, we'll there. get there um <laughs> before we switch to you know kind of a highly contested topic right now i do want to say i had another tweet come at me tried to watch women's hockey in 2014 the women took the winter off opportunity missed first of all the women have never taken a winter off they never have just because you didn't see them doesn't mean they weren't working 2014 toronto uh furies won the clarkson cup Uh, 2015, I basically, you know, kind of roasted this poor guy. I just sent all the pictures of every Clarkson. 14 Canada won too. Right. And, and they, they haven't taken a winter off. Um, These, these athletes have been working, you know, harder than ever before, harder than ever has been expected of them. And they're advocating for more for the PWHPA. So we welcome them back. We're happy to have them back on, on, you know, homeland here, Canada, us, all the countries, uh, you know, you've done women's hockey proud, And so I do want to switch gears a little bit because, you know, we're new to the podcast world and part of our identity was to keep everything pretty light and simple and talk about women's hockey. But if I don't talk about the wholesale change that's happening in the head office of the PHF, I worry that we're we're doing our fans a disservice. So recently through uh, Jeff Merrick, uh, they basically announced that Ty Tominio was going to be stepping down as the commissioner of the PHF. Uh, you know, since then, in the you know most recent hours, uh, we've seen other the deputy commissioner, um, the lead of partnership and sponsorship, the VP of business strategy and marketing. These are all people that have said this will be my last year with the PHF. At least that's how it's coming across. Again, mm-hmm. I'm not an insider. I don't I don't have the answers. Cax, if you're a player in women's hockey and in this league right now, what is going through your mind? I'm questioning a little bit of like, hopefully they got some kind of like information prior to all this. Um, when let's say changes happened in the CEDA back then, we kind of found out a little bit ahead, but not really or knew what was coming our way minus the end of it all. Um, <laughs> that one came <laughs> <surprised. laughs> minus the one news. But if I'm putting myself in, in their shoes, I'm a little nervous. I'm hoping that they are, you know, telling me that, these people are going to be replaced by so and so, and they have a plan in mind, and everything is coming, and it's going to be it's going to be okay. Like, don't worry about this. Um, but at the end of the day, too, like, why now, and why, right. why, in, in such a weird timing, either after announcing everything you were planning on doing with that group, right? Of you know, off front office, I, I would assume they had, and they were part of the plan, and um, I, I'm just, I yeah. A player being in that league or in any leagues, really, you want to know the information a bit ahead of time. You want to have it and you want to, ma- you want to be reassured. You want to be reassured <laughs> next year you have a, a space to play and, and, a, and you know, where yeah. it's going somewhere. Like That, I don't that know. transparency piece is something that we've been fighting. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like a constant battle when I'm talking. And, and you said it before, like when the CW show is around, this was a real a real argument that we had to have with you're our league, I- which is like, <laughs> uh, yeah, us uh, specifically, which is <laughs> if you're going to change the way I'm able to live my life by, let's say, adding a team in China and expecting me to leave my full-time job for yeah. two weeks, I need to know about that. Mm-hmm. And it was the exact same. It came out in a press release and it was like, this is great news. Look at this awesome opportunity. Excuse me. This is my life that I'm basically volunteering to this league because you know I love hockey and I love the game. But you can't make those decisions without your players. And I'm not saying this is the same, same scenario because, you know, the league operates on its own and the players are their own entity, but you're dealing with a league that just fired its players association director. 
So I'm, I'm just, I'm really, I'm concerned for these players. I hope that they have a voice. I hope mm-hmm. that they, like you said, I hope that they're receiving information ahead of these, you know, kind of seem seemingly knee jerk tweets or, you know, leaks or whatever you want to call and everything it. that's happening. Like, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's fragile. It's, it's, uh, it's nerve wracking. If I like, I would be nervous and I honestly just hope everything is good and that they have, like you said, a, a voice and they're being heard and that whomever was there before, if they had a really good relationship with them, I hope they're building a new relationship with whoever is coming in yeah. um, and that they're going to be thinking about the players. Cause it's all that matters. Like yeah. we've been fighting for that since day one. We, we, even when we first met with the end up back then, it was all about the players and, you know, having a say, and sitting yep. at the table and um, it, it, hopefully they do um, for their own futures and the future of that league. Definitely. And, and like you say, I mean, you and I have always been of the stance that, you know, w- the more women's hockey that is available to us post-college, the better off we are. Absolutely. Um, we are friends with these players. You know, we've been teammates with these players, definitely competed against some of these players. It's their well-being that, you know, we're looking out for right now. And I do believe that, you know, the PWHPA, we're working towards that truly sustainable future for the game. And uh, yeah, more to come. I mean, this is just a big, it's a big question mark right now. And, and we'll obviously stay tuned. So did yeah. you have, yeah, do you have something to add? I was just going to say, we, I didn't see that coming and I didn't see it coming because, you know, the, and maybe I'm going to switch top to the next that you're probably going to say, I didn't see it coming because people from there are reaching out to players and, you know, there's still tractions to, Hey, come play in the PHF and come play. And um, I just, I'm proud of the players that decide to, you know, take a stand. I'm also understanding of the players that do want to go play and have, you know, the right now hockey that they can get. It's totally understandable. Like no one is mad at anyone by any means. It's, it's a, we're all fighting for the same thing. We all women's hockey to grow. There's just different ways to do it. And that is, that is a narrative that I'm glad you brought up because (laughs) this whole idea of us, us versus them, like, listen, we all want women's hockey to move forward. (laughs) Yeah. That is an old story. We want women's hockey to move forward. We want to have a professional league. We want to have a sustainable future. Um, You know, we're working hard. And as Jeff Merrick said in the same thing, you know, the PWHP has been very lucky. We've been partnering with a lot of NHL clubs. There's more of that to come and everything's moving forward. And that's what I, that's all I want for the PHF as well. Keep moving forward, keep grinding it out. Hope they get, uh, you know, the right people in place. So we'll move on from that. Um, I'm sure there'll be more topics uh, on that issue to, to discuss at a later date, but where do you watch women's hockey now? The Olympics are done. Our athletes are coming back. Where do we watch them? Obviously, first and foremost, this weekend in Ottawa, yep. you can see uh, Montreal, Toronto, Boston, and Minnesota. Those four regions face off in Ottawa. Games are at 2 p.m. At, or 12 p.m. and 3 p.m., I believe. On Saturday. And Washington, March 36. And we have a, like a sneaky little treat, actually, for the listeners. Yeah, we have a couple coming, and I've, I've, I, we're not going to say one that I know, but we're going to say another one that you are about to talk about, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I know that there has been some talks about the Olympians possibly taking the ice again. Yes, yes. So, teaser that maybe matchups. We'll maybe, see. Maybe something happening. Maybe a matchup somewhere. Partnership with we'll see. The NHL teams. Who knows? Maybe. Who knows? It could be. Stay tuned. Yeah. And then there's more to come too. <laughs> more to come. <laughs> and of course, if you can't be in Ottawa this weekend, yes. Saturday's games uh, will be on YouTube, on our yeah, YouTube the channel. The PWHPA YouTube channel. And then Sunday should be um, on Sportsnet. So we'll see. Televised. Yeah, televised and everything. So catch us there. Um, but uh, if you can come and uh, I believe it's 50%. So buy your tickets uh, ahead of time. I'd suggest Perfect. that in terms of capacity uh, for the rinks. It's in the PN Sports Black, I believe. Or Love to hear it. Yeah. So get your ticket information and more at pwhpa.com. Cax, it was great to see you. Great to hang out just you and I. And a uh, big, a big guest coming up on Thursday. <sighs> Trust you, me, you do not want to miss this. We're pumped. We're so pumped. <laughs> She's going to be a blast. 
The Noxy and Cax Show on SDPN, produced in partnership with the PWHPA. Follow Noxy and Cax on Twitter at 27 Noxy and at Care LMR. The views expressed are those of the individuals and are not necessarily those of the PWHPA. Check out SDPN.ca for more Noxy and Cax and the rest of the SDPN crew. Free stars!